So just like you have a power series expansion for functions which are analytic, you have a series expansion uh, for functions with uh, singularity. Okay, so singularity just means that point where the function is not necessarily analytic. So this expansion is uh, in terms of both positive and negative powers of z or z minus z naught or whatever. The power series only non-negative powers, zero to infinity. But the expansion, series expansion around a singularity is going to be in terms of both positive and negative powers. So this expansion is what is called the uh, Laurent series. So let's, um, we will start by looking at an example and then state the theorem. We will not be proving the theorem as such. Of course, here is, you see the two possible ways of uh, doing things. Uh, you can define isolated singularities directly in terms of the behavior of the function near the point or and, and then get the uh, Laurent series or you can get the, the Laurent series and define the singularities in terms of the Laurent expansion. Okay, so it doesn't matter, of course, which way you do it, both are equivalent. So let me uh, give the Laurent series and then uh, define the various kinds of singularities in terms of the Laurent expansion. So let us just look at a uh, uh, simple example to start with. E power 1 over z. Of course, this is going to be analytic everywhere except at the origin, right? So this will have expansion like this or if you like uh, zero to infinity. So this is purely, I mean there are no positive powers less of the expansion. So you have 1 plus 1 over z plus 1 over uh, 2 factorial into z square and so on and so forth constant term and then all negative powers. Right. So this is the Laurent expansion for e power 1 over z. So, so 0 is an isolated singularity, right? The function is not analytic at 0 and that's all, it's analytic everywhere else. There is no other singularity, not only in any neighborhood but anywhere else also. Look at this, for example. Can you get expansion for this? And where is the expansion valid? So you can first of all write this as, put it uh, into partial fractions. So 1 over, what are you going to get? 1 over 1 minus z. Is that correct? Yes. 
So let's look at each of these separately and then plug them in back. So look at this first. So this you can expand as a geometric series provided modulus of this is less than 1. So this is provided mod that is less than 2. So this expansion is valid, the whole of this disk, bigger disk. Can we get an expansion for the other term? here, so that you want to end up with an expansion for the whole thing inside the annulus there. So 1 over 1 minus z, of course it has an expansion mod z less than 1, that is okay, that is not what we are interested in now, okay. Can I get something in that analysis? That means we want to expand this 1 over 1 minus z in mod z greater than 1, right? So what do you have to do? You pull out z. Right? So this is minus 1 over z one minus 1 by z you can expand geometric series provided mod 1 over z is less than 1 or equivalently mod z is greater than So if you combine both expansions, you can write that this has a series expansion consisting of this and this. Therefore, The positive powers here oh, oh. so this is the second term there, okay. So this is a minus sign. Right? 
both cases, the convergence is uniform on any compact domain inside this annulus. So in this case, of course, so that you can think of as an infinite annulus, right? And where the smaller radius is zero and the bigger radius is infinity. So in general, suppose. Annulus R one can be zero, R two can be infinity, as happened in the first example here. They both can be finite, non zero, one can be zero, other, in, other finite, positive, and so on. So all possibilities allowed. R one is greater than or equal to zero, R two is less than or equal to infinity. So in that case, the punctured disk, or a, as here, otherwise it's it's an annulus, or a punctured punctured plane. In this case, it can be a punctured disk or a proper annulus. Right? There are th three possibilities. When R one is zero and R two is infinity, you have the punctured plane. When R one is zero, R two is finite, you get a punctured disk. Right. So when uh, this is non-zero and this is finite, you get actual a uh, proper annulus. F has a series expansion. The form. I am writing around zero. You can also write around any point. You can instead of mod z there, you can write mod z minus z naught. Right? Okay, I am going to state the theorem. You can as well state in a general form, doesn't matter. Either you have a hole at Z naught or you have a, an annulus with center Z, Z naught. It doesn't matter anyway, either it is zero or not. The series. Converging locally uniformly uh, okay let's call this something okay mm -hmm. this is your omega now
such an expansion is unique. And in fact, you can write down what the coefficients are. They are given by same formula that as we had in the power series case. What was that? And factorial. And factorial the numerator denominator fn at z naught n varies over what now? Huh? n varies over all integers positive or negative. So what do you mean by fn for negative n? The other formula Cauchy's formula as a Cauchy integral, right? Not in terms of derivative. Integral 1 over 2 pi i or n factorial by 2 pi i, is it? n plus 1. Now, what is this contour here? Any circle which lies in the annulus, right? So you have the annulus there, so your CR is this. So in other words, you will get the same value whatever circle you take. independent of the radius that you take as long as it lies in, inside the annulus. Circle you take, you get the same value is a consequence of Cauchy's theorem for an annulus. Essentially, that says that you you take two So this is your annulus and you are taking two circles, C1 and C2 let us say, okay. Both of which lie in the annulus. Then integral over C1 is same as integral over C2. Okay, the idea is So you have, look at these two, okay. You make, you connect these two circles. So, go this way and then go this way. Come back and go back again. So that is go along one of the circles, go to the other circle via a card like that, complete the other circle, get back to where you started. So what, what do you do in effect? One circle, the other circle in the opposite direction 
and this line segment wants this way, the other two. So when you add up, this line segment goes away and you get this circle minus the other circle there equal to 0. Integral along this is 0. So the integral on this is same as integral on that. Essentially that is the idea because you have to make things precise. Why, why do you, how can you apply Cauchy's theorem to this? And then this expansion is got just by combining, just as in the example we had here, you get expansion inside the bigger disk minus uh, one uh, inside the other disk, combine the two, just as we had done in the example case, okay. So essentially you, you use the power series expansion for an analytic function. Only thing is that you will get in some place negative powers because of something happening like this, right. Outside something, power series expansion usually you have inside something right when you change z to 1 over z it becomes or 1 over in this case uh, 1 over z minus z naught to 1 over z minus z naught you get the expansion outside that disk okay so one inside the bigger disk the other outside the smaller disk you combine the two you will end up with an expansion of this type. That is the basic idea roughly, okay. So you have to do all the proper analysis and so on. Not difficult, but we will not go into that, okay. So the, when you say the expansion is unique, the coefficients are unique, that will not follow once you say that these are the coefficients, right. Any expansion will have this. So the series expansion that you get is called the Veron series. So, the Veron expansion. So what we had in these two examples are the, so the uniqueness, you do not have to calculate all these coefficients and so on using these integrals and so on. So, if you get, what did we do here? We just use some known expansion, namely geometric series expansion in this case, right? So if you can get expansion some way or the other, that is going to be the, the Laurent expansion because of the uniqueness, okay? So if you start with the function and suppose you are able to get a series expansion for this in a positive or negative powers of uh, Z, some way or the other, that is going to be the, the uh, Laurent expansion of the function. So it is not necessary that you go through all this uh, calculating the coefficients and all that to get the expansion as well. You can get it some way directly, simpler way, that is going to be the Laurent expansion. Once the expansion is valid, that is going to be the Laurent expansion. Just as we did in this uh, case, very simple case of, by going to partial parameters. That is the general fund. If you have a rational function, quotient of two polynomial, so you can always factorize the denominator to linear parts and then put them into, put the whole thing into partial fractions and use a similar technique. Uh, so now we can look, come to the other part of singularities, isolated singularities of a function. Suppose you have uh,
R can be infinite, never mind, it can be a punctual plane. But anyway, uh, so you are not saying anything about uh, what happens at Z0, right? Of course, if F is analytic at Z0 also, then fine, we already know the situation. F is analytic in a disk. So the interest is only when f is not analytic at z0. In any case, we can, in this case, we can write down the Laurent expansion for fz. So we have the The n factorial will not be there. Right. Hmm? That what? For negative integers, again, factorial will be a problem. <laughs> factorial will be set. Yeah, so you, in a punctured disk like this, you have this expansion. So, uh, Oh, by the way, the the negative power part, that means the part of the series, terms containing negative powers this part is called the principal part. of F or of the Laurent expansion. So this part is important for us, for our purposes now, when you want to consider singularities, right? The other part is just analytic. So there are three possibilities for the singular part. One. The singular part may not be there at all. That means all the negative coefficients are zero. A n zero for all n less than zero. Okay, that's the first possibility. What is the other possibility? There may be only finitely many negative coefficients which are non zero. A n is 0 for all but finitely many n negative or there can be infinitely many negative coefficients which are non-zero. So these three cases need to be considered separately. Okay, so in the example here, there are <laughs> It is the other extreme, right? There is no non principal part essentially. Only the principal part is present. Here, here in this case, of course, you have this and this both are there. Both are present. This one, a n is 0 for all n negative. In this case, z naught is called a removable.
singularity. Why is it called a removable singularity? Essentially, there is no singularity. You can do away with the singularity there. Make it analytic at the point also. We will come to that now. There are only finitely many non-zero terms, negative coefficients. Um, so, a n is uh, for, let's say, how do we write, for n negative, there are or let's say, um, all but finitely many a n or except <coughs> finite number of them all the others are zero so in this case so how does the series look like so, after some stage, everything is zero, right? So, in this case, we're going to have some minus k to infinity. Right? It's going to look like this. And take a k to be, a minus k to be, non zero right that is when you go to on the negative side it is the last one which is non zero after that everything is zero this is non zero and after that everything is zero of course some of them may be zero earlier right but after this everything is zero so, in other words, what you can, in terms of the uh, general coefficients, you can write a minus k is non-zero and a n is zero for all n, for all negative n up to minus k, so minus 1. all n less than minus k, minus k less than, less than is right, right, okay, minus k, after that minus k, minus 1, minus k, minus 2 and so on. So, in this case, you say that f has a the pole of order k at uh, okay of f z case 3 the last case is there are infinitely many a n's for negative n which are non zero In this case, it is called an essential singularity. And any of these cases, it is an isolated singularity, right? You are assuming that in in that disk, except for Z naught, the function is analytic anywhere. Okay, there is no other singularity 
in that neighborhood, so it's isolated singularity. So generally, without uh, classifying into this, that, or that, anything of this kind is called an isolated singularity. Say that z equal to z naught is an isolated singularity of f z if f is analytic in a function disk around z naught. So we have three kinds of isolated singularities: immovable, poles, and essential. The term pole was introduced later. Weierstrass himself define essential singularity and call uh, what we call uh, poles now as inessential singularities. So let us look at uh, the nature of these singularities a little bit more. Case one, so removable singularity. So in this case, you have what is the expansion now? All negative coefficients are zero, so zero to infinity. You have actually power series. The f is represented only uh, by the series only in the punctured disk. Okay, not at z naught. This expansion is valid. The punctured disk. So you cannot put z equal to z naught in the series. So how can f fail to be analytic at z naught in this situation? Even for continuity, for example, as z tends to z naught, you must get f of z naught if, if, if you can define f of z naught, right? So obviously, if at all f can be defined at z naught. It should be defined as what? The constant term here, right? When if you can put z equal to z naught here, what you are going to get is a naught, right? But you can't put z equal to z naught. But if you define f of see f is defined to start with only on the punctured disk, not at z naught. Okay, so in this case, in the case of removable singularity, we can define f at z naught in such a way that it becomes analytic in the whole domain, the whole of the disk. How do you define f of z naught? Just define it as a zero, the zeroth coefficient there. Okay, so f is defined by the series in the punctured disk. So if we define f of z naught equal to 0, a, equal to a naught, then in other words, now we are extending the definition of f from the punctured disk to the whole disk by defining it at the center. The redefined function f becomes an analytic function. in mod z minus z naught less than r, including at z naught. So there is no more a singularity at z naught. Singularity at z naught is 
removed right so <coughs> saying that z equal to z naught is a removable singularity is equivalent to saying that f <coughs> extends to an analytic function the whole of the disk Of course, the only point is to extend it at z naught. At every other point, is already analytic. Okay. So this happens if and only if limit what happens in the case of a pole. By the way, a pole of order one. It's called a simple pole. limit at z0 is infinite, <coughs> right, because negative powers, some negative powers are there, right, so all the positive powers will vanish as z goes to z0, but negative powers will give you infinite limit, even if there is one negative power, the limit will be infinite. Of course, if it is a pole of order k, what can I do? Uh, Z naught is a pole of order k. So you have uh, Z minus Z naught power minus k. After that, there is nothing. Okay. So if we multiply by Z minus Z naught power k, what will happen? there will be no negative powers in this case, okay. So that will have, so that will have what? It will be a removable singularity at Z naught, okay. Or essentially, uh, roughly speaking, Z minus Z naught power K times FZ is going to be analytic. You can define f at z naught so that this becomes analytic. Uh, so you can use this if and only if f this extends to an analytic function.
So, if you on what this means is ok. So, this is a complex number in infinity if you want <laughs> the point at infinity. What happens is of course, in every direction there is an infinity right, but all of them meet at a point ok. So, that gives you the Riemann sphere the north pole in the stereographic projection ok. So, in other words when you take the, the one point compactification of the plane you end up with the Riemann sphere. Mm -hmm. You have seen the one point compactification topology. One point compactification. So, forget it then. You can, if the space is not compact, you can add just one more point and define a suitable topology on that to make it compact, in which this space sits as a dense subspace. And compactification is a compact space in which your original space sits as a dense subspace. So, this is called one point compactification because you are just adding one more point to the space make it compact. Yeah, so essential singularity well there is nothing much to say along these lines because this limit may not exist, does not exist in fact limit of f of z as z goes to z naught. Uh, oh, in fact, oh, what does your Kasserati uh, Weistras theorem say? Huh? You have seen that? Uh, those who have studied complex analysis at least, it is called the Weistras theorem or sometimes as a Kasserati Weistras theorem. Uh, I think Alpo's uh, <coughs> the statement in the Alpo's is something of this kind in any deleted neighborhood of an essential singularity, a function takes values arbitrarily close to any given complex value. <laughs> so, what is this, what is the meaning of this? In, in topological terms, it means if you take a neighborhood of an essential singularity, of course, the singularity is not there. So, uh, the deleted neighborhood as one calls it. The image of that under the function is dense in the complex plane, right. It, it, the function takes values arbitrarily close to any given complex number means it is dense, right. So, the Cassel-Ritvay stress here, ok, let us state that. Oh, this was uh, probably Casarotti from the name, I think, uh, is an Italian mathematician. I haven't checked it. Casarotti proved it apparently in 1868 or something, but uh, Estras proved it independently uh, sometimes later in his lectures in 1875 or something. Like that. And let us say V is a deleted neighborhood of Z naught So, what do I mean by this? 
a neighborhood minus the point Z naught itself. Okay. So, however small you take this neighborhood to be, still the image is dense. Every deleted neighborhood, f takes values arbitrarily close to any given complex number. So, again, the there is only a weak result compared to the big Picard theorem. Just like the little Picard was uh, generalization of uh, Lewis theorem. So, the, the big Picard theorem says that in, in a deleted neighborhood of an essential singularity, the function takes all complex values except possibly for one. So, the image is actually either the whole of C or C minus single point. So, there is much more than saying it is dense, right. So, the big Picard or the great Picard theorem Must have come across Picard somewhere ago. Right? Differential equations, existence, uniqueness, zero, and so on. So, same Picard, MA Picard. Of course, you do not pronounce the D at all, the name P I C A R D. So, yeah, so D is never pronounced. R is just touched like this, aspirated Picard. A Laurent expansion. L A U R E N T. The last part you pronounce as wrong. Laurent. Okay, so, so that's what the great Picard theorem says that the the range of uh, F in any deleted neighborhood of an essential singularity is either the whole plane or a punctured plane. Okay, so you can write it down. I'm not writing it down. Okay, so here, uh, how is the little Picard <laughs> smaller than the great Picard? <laughs> so let let's make some noises about uh, the point at infinity. Hmm. So when you want to study the behavior of a function, the point at infinity, what you do is change z to 1 over z and look at the behavior at 0. In other words, you want to say something about fz at the point at infinity. Then look at f of 1 over z and see what happens at z equal to 0. For example, you say that f has a 0 at infinity if f of 1 over z has a 0 at 0. f has a pole at infinity if f of 1 over z has a pole at 0. Now, say order, order k there, if it is order k here. So, in essential singularity at infinity, same way, if f of 1 over z has, a, has an essential singularity at z equal to 0. This is the common usage, right. So, for example, if you look at the first example that we looked at, e power 1 by z, so 0 <coughs> was an essential singularity, so it says that infinity is an essential singularity for e power z. 
more generally, if you have any entire function, so an entire function has a power series expansion over the whole plane, sigma n z power n, radius of convergence is infinity. So when you change z to 1 over z there, you are going to get all negative powers only, just as per e power z, right. So, so what happens then for an entire function, point at infinity? So you have only negative powers at 0, right, around 0, I mean, when you take 1 over z, <laughs> okay. So you will have, the function will have an essential singularity at infinity, provided of course, unless it reduces to a polynomial. If it is a polynomial, then take a polynomial. What happens at infinity? A naught plus A one z plus A n z power n, the polynomial. When you change z to n over z, you are going to get A naught plus A n over z dot dot A n over z power n. So z equal to 0 is what for this? The pole of order n, right? So a polynomial of degree n has a pole of order n at infinity, right? Whereas uh, an entire function which is not a polynomial, that is what we had called as a transcendental entire function, has an essential singularity at infinity, right? I have not written things down, but I suppose. So, polynomial of degree n has a pole of order n at infinity. So the convention and all that I have not written down, I have told you orally. So what this means is when you change z to an over z, you get a pole at 0. Similarly, an entire function, transcendental entire function, has an essential singularity at infinity. Uh, if, if the word transcendental is uh, intimidating, forget it, just write an entire function which is not a polynomial. For example, sin z, cos z, all these have essential singularity is at infinity. And similarly, of course, you say that uh, function is analytic at infinity, same thing. Fz is analytic at infinity means, by definition, f of 1 over z is analytic at 0. Now, people always say regular, f is regular at infinity, means f of 1 over z is regular at 0. Okay, so I'll that gives some exercise for you on these uh, infinity things. Okay, so what happens in an entire function which is also analytic at infinity? A function which is analytic in the extended complex plane. So you're starting with an entire function. Okay, so you have a power series expansion, sigma a n z power n, valid in the whole plane. And you are saying something about infinity now. That is analytic at infinity. What does it mean? Change z to an over z, which gives you sigma a n divided by z power n. You have to see what happens at z equal to 0, right? At z equal to 0, if this is analytic, then what is the conclusion? 
there can't be any negative powers if you want another serial zero. So, except the constant term, all the coefficients will be gone. Or in other words, the function reduces to a constant. Right? An entire function which is analytic at infinity is a constant. I mean, just to familiarize you with uh, this behavior at infinity, okay? What about the, the, the converse of this? <clears throat> if you have an analytic function which has a pole of order n at infinity, then it's a polynomial of degree n. easily, I mean these are almost trivial things, but if you write it down you get some feel for how to handle behavior at infinity. Okay, so let's stop now. I'll have to say something about the residue at, a, at, an, at an isolated singularity. I don't know what all things I'll be able to say.